Hi, everybody. Welcome to your weekly broadcast on uh, distressed COVID advocacy, real estate marketing from a homeowner buyer, real estate agent, investor, pretty much anyone in the industry looking to do anything with a house perspective. We seem to be the uh, cornerstone at this moment for anybody who wants to talk about this topic. It's not a pleasant topic, but it's a very real topic. Let's uh, first and foremost, my name is Lee Honish. Go to leehonish.com. You can find all the links while my website's under construction for everything that I do, uh, including the 30-day hack, which I've already gotten first round of responses on, David. Uh, the 30-day uh, hack is sort of my belief that you can reprogram yourself. David and I are both a fan of a book called The Love Languages. Love language, uh, the languages of love. Languages of love, did I get it right? Um, five love languages. Five love languages, thank you. Clearly why I've never pulled it off. Um, <laughs> but that's a reprogramming mission, right? The book is based on reprogramming. If this is what your person likes, do more of this. Um, the 30 day hack that I've created is based on that, sort of based on, a, on the potato diet, which is if you wanna do something and you wanna reset yourself, you can do it with any topic. I'm not talking about psychological problems. I'm not talking about things that you need to go see an actual doctor about. Um, I'm finishing it up. I'm gonna put out the first series of videos on the topic. I'm hoping within the next week to actually put out 30 days of video that everybody can follow. It's 100% free. Um, I believe that anybody in business, in life and in service, it doesn't matter if you program yourself correctly, reset yourself correctly, you can move forward. Just go to leehonish.com, sign up. If there's a form, I'll get the info, I'll get a hold of you, and uh, we'll go from there. Also, marketing in pretty much every podcast, broadcast, and piece of media I create. With that said, I'm joined by David Bartels, the largest, greatest, and most awesomeness. Awesomeness. I use that <laughs> word. <laughs> I keep coming up with adjectives. I like inventing them. Uh, awesomeness. Uh, short sale negotiator, but distressed property advocate on the planet. We have uh, built a team here to try to work with people in a COVID or a mispayment situation to try to bring homeowners and agents and people in our industry the best possible information. We are the ones who did it at the beginning. We are the ones still doing it. We are the ones who've been talking about it since 2006 and change, based on my math. Uh, David Bartels is with Home Loan Advocates. First and foremost, David, tell them about Home Loan Advocates. Well, we're short sale negotiators. So if you've got um, an issue with a property that's underwater and you want expert negotiation that probably doesn't cost you anything because the bank pays the fees, then um, you'd call us 805-413-8000, 805-413-8000, or you can email me at david at home loan advocates dot com advocates is plural david at home loan advocates dot com and david you're working on something completely innovative new and different which is you were just showing off to the camera before we went live show it off for the room and david what is ever home so ever home is a technology enhanced um, real estate company that is really designed to help sellers leverage the technology to leverage technology that exists to list their own home in the same way that buyers are already using technology to buy a home. Literally, a seller is going to be able to use their phone, spend about 20 minutes and push their, their house right onto the multiple listing service with a stop for quality control. Um, with the same ease that you could comp or easier than even using a product like TurboTax to do your taxes. So I got a preview of it a few days ago. I'm beyond excited. Um, we're days away from any, it could be today where Ever Home Realty is going to be approved to do business and help you sell. Will full service realty will no longer exist and we will soon to be Ever Home with a October um, going public date and national expansion from there. With all of that said, uh, you recently did, you went outside the family and you did a different broadcast, you did a different podcast. So um, I'm trying not to be jealous about it. 
trying. As a producer and a guy who puts out a lot of content, I'm trying. I'm trying. I understand. You've got to see other people. Um, <laughs> we're just in that dating phase. Uh, talk about the other podcast you did and give them a little bit of a, a pop. Maybe someone would want to go. In oh, well, you know, it's going to be published tomorrow. I did a I did a podcast with Neil Hughes. He's a he's a UK uh, podcaster and he does a daily podcast on technology and somewhere or another he found out about what we were doing around the seller technology and around blockchain and thought it would be interesting fodder for his viewers and so we recorded a 30-minute podcast and um, I sent Lee this morning a preview of that and it's going to go it'll go live tomorrow once it uh, and we'll have the links to that so those of you that are interested in hearing that are certainly invited to listen to it so it's it's really about our new ever home technology our seller technology plus how we're incorporating blockchain to create the world's first blockchain escrow and title company i'll probably be a little more shameless than that since he's in the uk and i'm not going to worry about copyright infringements i'll probably yeah. download it turn it into a video so that it goes up on the coaching page and also download the audio and put it up on our own podcasting channel um, <laughs> But he'll get all the pop for it, so I'll make sure he has all the links in the. Uh... Sorry, I'm I'm shameless. I'm shameless. Those who can't borrow liberally, I'm just uh, I'm just saying that for the record. Uh, this is a live broadcast. We do invite anybody who's in the real estate industry, including homeowners, for that matter. Uh, we've never really invited you. You can go to coachingcalls.info. Um, dot info. Coachingcalls.info. There's a link. You can join us live. We only uh, record for about 30 or 40 minutes, and then we do live questions. Last week, everybody got a new rock me like uh, raw raw pitch, not from David, shockingly from me. Um, but we do live questions after the call for those that are here live. We do check them occasionally. Uh, today, there's a lot of news that's gone on. First and foremost, I want to say this because I know we have a lot of a new fan base. Um, First and foremost, how is everything going in uh, COVID-based land in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for you, David? Well, we're ha we're busier than we've ever been. So we've got more escrows than we've ever had. We'll by the end of the day, we'll be back up to 20 escrows. We keep going 18 to 20 um, escrows right now, based on stuff that's closing versus um, new escrows that we're getting. Um, we'll list a couple, two or three more houses by the end of the day. And so COVID is not impacting our business. It's been really bustling um, around here. Um, and by the way, when I say we've got 20 escrows, I've got three salespeople. So my, my eight, we're averaging over six transactions in escrow per agent. You know, most, most, and that's a, a result of our marketing. That's a result of our our lead conversion, that's the result of the technology um, that we're using um, that's really led us to evolve to Everhome. So it's an exciting time. And if, especially if you can control listings, you're really going to do well. Uh, with all of that said, uh, for those that are on the live call, go ahead and load up your questions at any time. I know that Victoria has already put a question in. I will get to those. Um, I want to cover some of the hot news topics that have covered before we get to our kind of two main stories for this week. I'm interested in both of them. Uh, first and foremost, let's talk about what the president did this past weekend. No, I'm not talking about wanting to put his face on Mount Rushmore, which is amusing. <laughs> very amusing. By the way, if I were president, that's the first phone call I would make. All right. You're, you remind me of John Oliver right now. <laughs> would, I not, would I not have put... Like that's either that or be a McDonald's character. I gotta be honest. I would rather be on Mount Rushmore or one of the McDonald's characters, uh, right next to Grimace and Ronald McDonald himself. Good for you, Mr. President. That's the way to go. Um, and I'm not here to talk politics. We don't do that on this show. However, if you listen to us long enough, we kind of question what the president does occasionally. I'm going to we'll question, question a lot that. of what we'll he question did. The next president too. It doesn't matter. Oh, it doesn't matter. Let's start <laughs> with one of the things he did this past weekend, which is the 
I recommend you put a moratorium in place. And if you reelect me, then I'll justify it. Uh, executive order that he signed in. So I've read it. And it's the funniest thing I've ever read. He is recommending to states that there is a moratorium on a federal level till the end of the year. If he is elected at the end of the year, he will uh, rectify it so that it continues on. Now, I don't know much about bait and switch, David. I don't, I don't, I, I don't claim to be a lawyer or understand any of those high level concepts. But if I was running for president and let's say that I'm, I don't know, 10% or 20% behind in the polls based on reports and people are about to be evicted on a scale that we have not seen since the great depression, which is actually starting to occur, Boy, this is a really logical move on his part. A, a federal moratorium on evictions is suggested. By the way, they don't have to take it up. Um, and he will rectify it and extend it if he is reelected. Basically, that's what's been said. Um, I still think that this is a state to state issue. Here in California, because we're pro renter, pro homeowner, you guys are safe till the end of the year. You can tell your you can tell your landlord to go turn sideways, but come January, uh, December 31st, you owe seven or eight months of rent, period. That's just the way it works. Uh, maybe you can expand upon this on moratoriums and what you're seeing and what you're hearing or your personal feelings. Well, if he could mandate uh, a moratorium at the executive level, he would not have suggested it. So it's really just political fodder. And, you know, it's really up to each state. now. I happen, we happen to be residents of California who might be the most liberal state in the union. And basically what they are are saying is that 90 days after the moratorium, after the COVID restrictions are lifted, which is easily gonna get us through to the end of the year. Now, I hear that there is some legislation being wrestled up that's going to clarify when that is and put a definitive date on that. Um, we haven't, I'm really seeing that. So it's it's really hard to say. Right now, it is really impossible to evict somebody in California, and it's impossible to foreclose on somebody in California. And even if you were permitted to do that, you can't get a, a court hearing to do it. So yeah, I agree. I, so look, I would say this. I would say this if you're in California, there's a couple of other places that are like this. If you're looking towards the end of the year, and I've done eviction work, that's how I got into the business. Nice and loud too. Um, I did it last week, it's all right. Um, this is a quality broadcast. So not like those UK folk. Uh, I would say this, realistically, if you're a homeowner or a renter and you don't pay in the end of the year, the bill comes due no matter how it plays out, the very best scenario is you're not in court on an unlawful detainer till that next summer. That's the worst, like that's not making a single payment from now until next May, June, July. Like, and then you gotta go another 30 days on top of that. I would think from right now to next year to full eviction, you're looking at about a one year cycle, at least in California, probably Texas, probably Florida, New York's even slower. So, I want to clarify something because I don't think you, I, I'm certainly not advocating that people not pay their rent. All right. We're, we're just talking about the more. I, wait, I want to make it clear. I don't have a real estate license, so <laughs> I can advocate whatever the hell I want. Well, is that what you're advocating? Oh Are my God. Wait, hold rent? on. If we were talking the old short sales days when I was approved by like a half dozen states to do continuing education, my advice would be do every effort you can to make all your payments and stay yeah. current. And all now, right, right now, you people are crazy. So let's just talk about the pros and cons of doing that so we have a balanced discussion <laughs> because we don't agree here. All right. So. so. So the balanced discussion is be, you know, listen, if you can't make your mortgage, if you can't, not your mortgage, but yeah, your mortgage or your rent payment, if you can't, that's one thing, okay, then don't. You still owe the money. You can still get, you know, even after you can get evicted, you still owe the money. 
that landlord is going to be able to haul you into court and get a judgment lien against you to be able to get it, you know, to do that. Now, whether or not you can pay or not pay and it's whether or not it's collectible, that's a different conversation. But small claims court is up to $10,000. So that's where most people are going to go. If you do have the ability to pay and you decide not to pay, you're going to be, you're, that's going to be a problem because if you do end up in court and you have to explain why you didn't pay and you, and they're able to demonstrate or you confess because you will be under oath that you were not, that you were still gainfully employed and your income wasn't impacted by COVID, which is the case. And you still didn't pay because it was strategic and you thought you could just take a, you thought moratorium met payment holiday. You're going to be in big trouble. You're going to, you, I, I think that the courts are going to make some examples out of people um, who abuse that situation. Just my opinion, of course. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. And that's what we actually saw with the first distress go around. And I'm not disputing any of that. I'm just talking from a time frame perspective. I mean, realistically. Um, and certainly if you're using your 401k, if you're borrowing on credit cards, Let's talk about this for the homeowners for a second, David, because this is now becoming a real thing again, okay? People using credit, running up their credit, people using yeah. their 401ks don't, and don't cash. Do that. Yeah, that, we've seen this show, it doesn't end well. Yeah, don't um, do that. Take, you know, if you need to borrow the money to make your mortgage payment, don't make the mortgage payment. Because what happens is, you know, unless you're certain that it's short term, a month or two, and that you're going to be gainfully employed or you're going to resume your employment, whatever the case, if you're certain of that and you're going to cure this, the unemployment situation or the loss of income situation that put you in a position where you couldn't afford your payment, then maybe. But if, if you just have a hope that you're going to get back to work and that you're going to be able to, your income is going to resume at, at pre-income loss levels, then you the worst thing that you can do is borrow money to make the mortgage payment because I've seen this happen over and over. I've seen people deplete, and that includes borrowing it from your own savings account. I've seen people deplete their savings account, deplete their 401ks, deplete their kids' college funds, run up their credit cards, borrow money from friends and family, to save a house that they eventually lost. So not only did they end up losing the house, they still end up owing all that money and their problems were just compounded. And my advice now, my advice then is the same. It will always be the same that if you're going to lose your house, lose it with money in the bank versus losing it with no money in the bank. Th that is the, what the moratorium is about. So you should be increasing your savings, not decreasing your savings. Skip the payment, deal with it later. Um, the likelihood is, is that you're gonna end up with a loan modification or a forbearance that's either going to extend your loan or create a lump sum last payment for the missed payments in all likelihood. It is very probably not going to result in an actual foreclosure. It might result in a foreclosure start, but if you end up being gainfully employed, um, the banks are likely to work with you to resolve that one form or another. It's going to look different than 2008, um, but nonetheless, it's going to, there. you're going to see a lot of pressure on the banks to just push those payments to the end of the loan if you've regained employment. Now, if your unemployment is long-term, and things start to clear up and you're still not back to work and then you're gonna face foreclosure. But if you're able to get back to work and resume making a payment, you're probably gonna be okay, even though there's gonna be some work to do. Our next story, <laughs> in my best non-Cockney John Oliver like, yes, and by the way, thank you for the great compliment on John Oliver. Um, his research team does an amazing job of look, making him look good. Um, our next story, Executive order for the $400. All right, let's discuss this so you guys can explain this to your potential buyers, sellers, whomever. Um, as I understand it, the states must cover 25% of that money. Which is $100 uh, per week. Right? Per week. 
which if you're in California means zero dollars and zero cents because we have no money. Um, so it only applies to states that actually have a surplus. Uh, and then the most disturbing part of this, based on what I can tell, um, he's borrowing from Social Security to pay for this. Like, that's the craziest part of this. He's, well, since, you know, let me be John Oliver-like right here. Since we're killing the old people anyway with COVID, <laughs> um, they don't need the money. They don't need the money anymore, David. Oh, that um, is so inappropriate, but okay. <laughs> I gotta be me. I gotta be me. Oh yeah, that's fine. I've gotta be me. Um, all right. Since Social Security isn't needed anymore because, well, we have a staggering amount of death and mostly people above the age of fifty. Which he's is gonna me. use. Social, he's gonna. Well, yeah, and me too. He's gonna use Social Security money to pay the other three hundred dollars to the state, with the hopes that. When I get to the election, when I win, I'm going to work this out and I'm going to reallocate money from somewhere else. Um, forget that it's unconstitutional. All right. Let's just excuse the fact that he can't actually do what he's doing. It's technically unconstitutional, which means it would be a court case. There's no way to physically enact it. Uh, we're back to what we said with the previous uh, moratorium, which is this is political fodder once again and nobody should count on this. Right, no, I think that's right. I, you know, I, I listen, I haven't read it in detail. I just, I've just seen the headlines um, from what you're saying and there, even he anticipates um, legal challenges. It's really just politics. So just trying to appeal to, just trying to generate some votes. And so we'll see how it plays out, but I would not, um, if I were unemployed and I needed that $400, I would not be celebrating yet. The likelihood, and even if it does come, it's going to take weeks or months to work its way you know, to you. So I would just be very careful. I would still do my very best to go out and generate my own income, even if it's doing a job that I wouldn't be proud of doing to take care of my family. Yeah. Um... And I've said this on previous shows, uh, as much as my personal beliefs disagree with wanting to be on Mount Rushmore, hilarious. <laughs> it's just so funny. That is so Trump. It's funny. Um, excluding all, all of the pretense of all of that, I agree with the campaign that they ran, which is do something. I don't even care if it's volunteering your time. I I'm kind of, I've obviously gotten older. Here's the thing. I had a daughter who turned 16 on Thursday, who when I saw her for the first time in several months based on COVID, uh, looked like an actual woman, which scared the literal crap out of me um, <laughs> to the point that it was almost shocking. I mean, they put me at the far end of the yard, um, 20 feet away from guests, because apparently I live in a high COVID traffic area here at the beach where nobody cares whether or not you wear a mask. But staring at my daughter across the yard with my glasses and a pair of binoculars, I realized that she was now a fully formed woman in the real world. And, and in looking at that, it somehow changed me dramatically on Thursday. Um, and I was lucky enough to spend time on Saturday with a friend who had small children. And I kept thinking, there's this weird gap, right? My daughter's gonna know the next year or two years of being at home. Like even a person who's graduating in a couple of years might not have an actual graduation. There might be a partial home, stay at home. We're in a, in a very strange new world and it has somehow affected me greatly over the last five days, which has turned me into probably a nicer person. I don't know, maybe more cynical on the topic, but. We have literally lived in a society, David, where we're living for today and not thinking about tomorrow. I don't care if it's global warming, whether or not you want to believe in it. I don't care if it's about garbage. I don't care if it's about real estate. Nobody's looking forward. Nobody's reviewing the past. 
we're living in the moment because we're so stricken by the dollar that we're terrified. I honestly, the number one thing I I see, and certainly when I was creating the 30 day hack, I brought this into play. We are so relegated by fear for our next action based on our family, based on our food, but, you know, all the primal stuff. So I, I just want to get your feedback. Why is it that we are a fear driven mammal? We, we don't, we shouldn't be. We're at the top of the food chain. We're smart. We can outthink this. We've got technology, but everything is based on fear, fear of what this country is going to do to us, fear of what the real estate market's going to do to my business, fear of what's going to happen to my children, fear of what's next. Tomorrow's going to happen no matter what. No matter what, David, the sun's going to wrap around this planet and you and I are going to have to deal with tomorrow. And I, I've been trying very hard now <laughs> for a while to go, tomorrow's a different shade of colors. And you just deal with it and you work with it and you try to move with it. Um, especially for the people on the call. How do you wake up every day and just not try to let fear dictate the next action? Oh, well, that's an easier question than why people are fearful. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The, you know, I just have, some, I have some thoughts. I don't know. They work for me. Maybe they'll work for other people. But my thought is, is simple. For me, I focus on what I know, not what I don't know. I don't worry about um, things that are outside of my control. The chips are gonna fall where they may. I can only focus on the information that I have have right now. And so that what that means is is that I don't have I don't have time or energy or focus to hypothesize what I am going to, you know, what might happen. The other thing is that I know is that and what makes this easier is that most of what I fear doesn't come true. Things are almost never as bad as I anticipate that they're going to be. And so it's it just is a it, it's just a, an emotional roller coaster I put myself on when I you know go through a thousand what if scenarios trying to you know play life like chess and you know not only anticipating my next move but anticipating my move based on what I think other people might or might not do, what what information that might or might not become available. And I find that that is exhausting. And and what I've been able to validate is that the, my mind reading skills suck. My prophecy is terrible. And so I really just have to focus on what I know. And when I do that and I focus on where I'm at, and I work based on the information that I have, I can make the best decisions for myself in that situation and give myself permission to make a new decision if there is new information that later becomes available as a result. So, and one other thing is that it is a decision not to make a decision. So one of, one of the hold best on, hold on was that I a rush quote hold on decide. hold on hold on i just got to do it for me was that a rush quote that's a free will quote if you no, choose not know. to decide you've made a choice maybe i don't know i don't know where oh my i, gosh. I that. but it is a decision nonetheless so what we are you know what we're doing is we're deciding not to um decide and sometimes um it's very appropriate to decide not to decide if you don't have all the information you need to decide. So it's it's sometimes the best decision is just to push making a decision. Yeah, actually, um, and I'll make the argument the other way. There have been many times where I like to think of myself as a guy who understands what's going to happen tomorrow. I do. Um, I kind of pride myself on that, and I'm mostly okay on the topic. But when it comes to really tough decisions, especially in life, I'll just let tomorrow happen. I'm not going to make a decision. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. It's very matrix-like almost. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen, whether or not I'm involved in it, be involved in it. And I just wanted to do that for the people on the call or the people listening to the call. Um, fear is really driving this market uh, for the good and for the bad. And you've got to be aware of it. Fear is 
probably the most tangible thing about this market that I can say that is comparable to 2007, uh, especially when it comes to real estate. Is my house at the top of its market? Is my house going to depreciate? Should I buy now? Should I buy later? Will I be able to rent? Will I not be able to rent? These are very tangible, fearful things because they're primal, right? So what are the three primal elements? And I don't want to show off my psychology degree, but um, tangibly speaking, and everybody in real estate needs to be aware of this, lodging, lodging and protection of the family are well, top two. Yeah, right. Number three is reproduction. But the first two are feeding shelter, feeding shelter protection, feeding shelter protection. And then you go into reproduction because that's just a mammal thing. Well, is that how life. simple life is? Room, board, reproduction? Yeah, actually it is. Um, <laughs> and strangely, that's all it really ever comes down to. Uh, but the reason I bring that up, when you're talking, and I said this in 2007, when you're talking about where people live, where they breathe, where they keep their family, where they feed their family, you're talking about very primal things within a human being. I mean, this goes to anything living on the planet. We share this in our collective DNA about wanting to protect and have that protection. And we've seen it time and time again. We've talked about it with short sales. We've talked about it with real estate in general. We, it's fundamental. People are going to be fearful. They're going to be fearful of you. And you need to be completely aware of this and empathetic to this. And if you don't own that skill, then you've got to compensate with expertise. If you can't compensate with expertise, then compensate with something else. And I'm just talking about this from uh, for the agents, David. If you don't have one thing, do something else that you're good at that will give them the comfort in the other fields. I think expertise, right? I've met a lot of doctors that are the coldest assholes I've ever met in my entire life, but they're the guy I want, you know, cutting me open because to them, it's a matter of fact, this is going to, uh, my daughter had a cyst when she was a child. It was very traumatic. And it was recommended by Children's Hospital of San Diego that she had it removed. And I asked him a pretty serious question and he was almost matter of fact and brushed me off about the whole thing. And I went, that's the guy I want to do it. He had no empathy on the subject. It was just a matter of fact. Um, it didn't make him a bad guy because he had no bedside manner. And I wouldn't say that I didn't cry or that the whole thing wasn't the most traumatic thing I ever went through in my entire life. Um, even thinking about it, it still bothers me. I would say this for everybody on the call who's a real estate agent. You've got to pick up the ball here. Um, talk about advocacy for a minute, David. Um, you have a diverse array of agents. They're not all empathetic, lovely, I'm going to hug you and this is going to be okay, people but they've got to be able to compensate in some other way. Well, you know, we, it's interesting. We had a, a meeting on this yesterday, a company wide um, meeting, and we really focus on what do we want our brand to be? What do, what do we want to do? It's, you know, first of all, we've been having a big debate eternally as we make the transition to ever home is what, do, what title do you give a salesperson? What, <laughs> you call them realtor, do you call them buyer's agent, do you call them listing agent, do you call them agent, do you, what do you call them? And the reason why that's such a struggle for me, the, the reason that's just such a struggle for me is that nobody ever hired a salesperson to help them solve a problem related to their house. They're looking for somebody to really, you know, advise, they don't want to be sold something. What people want is they want to be able to gather information and make a well-informed decision. And so our company is run from a position of advocacy, but it's in its simplest form. And it doesn't have, and advocating for somebody doesn't necessarily mean that they're in distress or they've got a massive problem. Advocating for people is more like a fiduciary. And that is really taking time to find out what those people want, what somebody wants, and then spending the rest of the time helping them get it. And without 
a focus on how much money am I going to make as a result of investing this time and expertise in them. Now, that's not to suggest that you that you shouldn't be for profit, that you shouldn't charge for your services. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying at the core of our interaction is what do you want and how can we help you get there? And that includes, as a result of listening to our consumers, developing products and services that will help them get there. So when we talk about distressed properties, we provide free, free foreclosure um, postponement services. We provide free loan modification um, coaching, but we get paid to do short sales. And we figured out how to get paid by the bank and not from you know, the seller or the agent you know, 72% of the time. You know, from a from a listing perspective, we're saying we're seeing sellers are struggling every day to figure when they go to sell their house. Do I go unrepresented so I don't have to pay these except what they consider? Ex, I'm not saying they're excessive, but what they consider is excessive realtor fees to sell their house of five or six percent of the sale price, or do you know and and assume the risk of doing it myself? Or do I avoid the risk and begrudgingly agree to pay more than I think that I should in order to have somebody solve that problem? And so what we did was after listening to consumers is we created a hybrid, something that allows them to do both. So for instance, our for sale with seller program basically allows, allows them to hire us to put their house on the multiple listing service for them. So they literally list it themselves and they take the calls, they handle the showings, they answer the questions related to um, the sale of their house, but they avoid the critical elements of negotiation, paperwork, escrow, title, disclosures, that kind of thing, by having that offer come to us directly where we fully represent them in that transaction without charging them a big five or 6% of the sale price to be able to do it, thereby allowing to save thousands, tens of thousands of dollars um, in commissions while still getting the massive exposure and the full service representation as if they paid somebody 6% to list their house. The other way that we advocate is by giving them an option. Do you want full service or do you want self-service? So those are, you know, do you want to be more involved? Do you want us to take care of everything? And the same is true for each part. So as we look at the kinds of interactions that we have, we're advocating in the sense of we're giving people options. We're not trying to talk them into one thing or another. And we're providing services at a level that are not income driven, but more service driven and, and where they're more consumer centric. And we're focused on building long term relationships that will turn into income producing events as a result of that valued relationship that we build. With that said, this is our quick break before I do our top story of the night. Um, and I do have a top story of the night. Uh, David, give people a way to contact you. Well, you can reach me by email at david at everhome.io, david at everhome.io. And you can call me at 805-379-3300. And if you'd like to find out more about all the broadcast podcasts, 30 day hacks, real estate marketing, marketing in general, go to leehonish.com. Simple as that. All right. With that said, our top story of the night, David, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I feel like I need to drop in probably audio music at this moment. I probably will in post-production for those listening to the podcast. Enjoy it. Here it is. Cool. Um, our top story, I'm going to go with the top five coronavirus myths. This comes to us from Erica Sweeney of Realtor.com. The top five coronavirus myths everyone thinks debunked. Uh, David and I are actually going to debunk them. I will read her responses as well. Number one, David, brrr, it's a terrible time to sell your house. Many homes who may have hoped that the, uh, to put their house on the market uh, this summer have put plans on hold. In early July, new home listings dropped 14% compared with one year ago, and a total inventory of 32% uh, lower, according to Realtor.com weekly housing trends for July 11th. 
Fear of coronavirus exposure is probably the main reason people are keeping their homes off the market, but my, uh, many might also assume that selling a home right now is just a futile endeavor. But on the contrary, the latest statistics suggest that now is one of the best times in years to sell their homes. All right, we'll start right there, David. The biggest, one of the biggest myths. It's a terrible time to sell your house. So let's talk about this for a minute. On a global level, yes, there are markets that are taking hits. New York has seen a decrease. Uh, some of the markets have seen a decrease. You in the Ventura Valley, in the Conejo Valley, that's not the case. And I can tell you that for LA, Orange, San Diego, that's not the case, even though people are vacating. Um, we went, one of the weird things in California that's going on is that our growth rate went flat, right? We're, people don't want to be out here as much because we keep raising taxes to the point where it might not be worthwhile for everybody. But with that said, what are the values like for you? Is this a terrible time to sell your house? I mean, from my perspective, this is the, the hottest seller's market that I've ever seen. And there's no reason that it looks like it's going to fade. And the reason that it is um, so hot is because of that limited inventory. And when you say that inventory is down 14%, that must be a nationwide number. I've seen numbers um, as high as 45%. And buyer demand far outweighs available inventory. And we are seeing multiple offers um, on properly priced properties. And they're selling well above asking price within a couple, three days. And I think that trend is going to continue. And the summer selling season is going to be extended into the fall, deep into the fall. I want to make this a note. Realtor.com is in no way associated with the National Association of Realtors. Realtor.com is owned by Fox News. Just thought I'd say it out loud, since I'm the only one who followed that trend. Number two on the list, home prices are plummeting. Data shows just the opposite. Home prices are actually rising. According to the National Association of Realtors, they actually quoted it. The national median price for single family homes grew 7.7% .7 in the first quarter of 2020 to $274,600. We're seeing a home price grow faster than pre-COVID, Hale said, in the fact that they are on pace with home prices we saw last time this year. How are prices out there for you? I know in San Diego, prices are through the roof. Orange County's through the roof. LA, it's market to market, Riverside, San Bernardino, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we talk about this a lot. Real estate is per market, right? It's um, dictated by your market. It's not dictated by the national perception. And I've said this a million times and I wanna make it abundantly clear for agents, homeowners, investors, anybody. Your market may be special. David's market is expanding. I know what he's about to say, but it is dictated by what the homeowners see on MSNBC, CNBC, um, CNN, Fox News. Their vision of the market is based on a national projection instead of a local projection. David, let's talk about this. Home prices are not plummeting. Um, I know that they are in certain markets, but how is it for you? Well, I mean, for me, we're seeing prices are moving up. And again, but that's driven based on the same supply and demand that's creating the multiple offers. So anytime you've got a, a, a market environment where buyers are competing with each other to raise prices, you're not, you're not gonna see lower prices. Lower prices only happen when there aren't buyers competing for properties. And the result is sellers, because of the surplus of inventory versus the buyer demand, sellers start competing with each other to lower the prices. So we're not seeing any sign um, of that at all right now. And there may be some markets around the country where that is happening or could happen in the short term, but I'm not aware of any of those markets yet. We're not, you know, I'm not engaged in markets that are having any kind of not only price depreciation, but threat of price decreciation, depreciation. As long as there's an inventory shortage, prices are going to go up. Oxnard? Prices are going up. Oh, geez. You know the world is ending when Oxnard's going up. I, I just wanted to say it out loud. That's just me making a ha-ha. Uh, number three, buyers are holding off on home purchasing. No. 
I don't even need to read whatever he's saying. I know he's got stats here. We have way more buyers. We have way more people coming onto the market. We have way more people who have been renting, leaving their houses. Um, buyers holding off on home purchases as a myth. That's crazy, David. Um, let's talk about it right there. First, let's talk about it two ways. Buyers holding off on purchases or loans not being available. I would say this, anything above five or $10 million on a commercial or a residential level, it's gonna be a little tough because you're gonna find it difficult to find anybody to get involved on a national level. I just know this as a fact. Nobody is making big loans right now. But if we're talking residential or smaller loans, David, let's talk about this. Buyers aren't holding up. We have more buyers than sellers and that's what's causing the imbalance uh, let's talk about that for a second. Well, you you have some buyers that are holding off, but relative to the number of listings, there's an abundance of buyers. So, I mean, what what's going to happen is that when the restrictions get lifted, you're going to see a surge of listings come to the market. And that's when the big market test is going to happen is whether or not buyers are going to be able to continue to absorb um, that growing inventory that is anticipated. But but yeah, I mean, yes, there probably are fewer buyers, but relative to opportunity, um, there is an abundance of, there is far higher buyer demand than there is available inventory. So it's a, it's a different side of the same coin. Uh, number four, homes can't be viewed in person as stated issues, stay at home school, social distancing mandated, uh, depending on your state of the COVID-19 outbreak. Many in-person home showings and open houses were put on temporary hold in favor of virtual home tours. But by now, most of these restrictions have been list, uh, lifted uh, city to city, county to county, no matter what it is. So let's talk about it. So from a buyer perspective, David, um, homes can't be viewed in person. Is this a real thing? It's not a real, even when they weren't allowed to be viewed in person, people were viewing them. <laughs> You know, when LA when LA County had a moratorium, we we had a seller that was wanted to show their own house. I and I said, Well, you're not allowed. He said, Well, I want to show it. We went on the market and he had like 30 showings in two days, um, even when nobody was allowed to look at properties. And now you're permitted to to show. There are there's just some common sense that needs to take place. So there's you know, you want people to wear masks, you want to open doors, you just you want to be Yes, you can see it. And one other thing is that we've been offering virtual tours for all of our listings and and everybody else's listings for that matter. And when we give buyers the option to look at it virtually or go see it in person, 99% want to see it in person. They don't want to buy, they don't want to make a buying decision based on touring the home virtually they want to go in there and meet the home up close and personal before making a decision i think that's going to continue well and i want to go with a caveat on this um since you've had many escrows and you're still continuing to do escrows i'm going to go way out on a limb based on social distancing i'm guessing appraisers aren't doing virtual appraisals um, I'm, we're not seeing, we're not seeing virtual appraisals. They have the option to do virtual appraisals, but that's not what they are. Um, they're not doing, they're going inside and it's, listen, it's business as usual, COVID, no COVID, <laughs> business as usual, except there's limited inventory and lots of buyers. All right. With that said, number five and our last on the topic board, which I actually enjoy every, uh, this will be a little weird. I don't know how to work this for you, David. Uh, everyone is fleeing the cities for the suburbs. This is probably the most rampant myth of all and certainly makes sense from a pure impulse level. Since urban centers like New York, even LA, which has a large condo community at this point, uh, and downtown San Diego actually, make social distancing far more challenging than in less densely populated areas. Why would city dwellers flee in mass and try to buy a house in the burbs? Well, this one is partially true. Yes, listings in the suburbs are drawing more attention these days. Um, the numbers 
uh, views on properties that are within suburban zip codes have increased by 13%. I don't know if this applies in the Valley for you, David. I don't, you know, just to be frank and honest, but I know in LA, San Diego, Orange County doesn't really have a downtown scene. Downtown LA created all the condos and the down life. Um, San Diego invested ungodly amounts of money into building condos in downtown San Diego. Um, downtown Phoenix, Arizona, Austin, Houston. Um, is it that way? Do people want to get a little further away from everything else? Well, the exodus um, has to do with two things. First of all, I've been seeing an exodus in our market for years. You know, I, I would say 60, 70 percent of all home sellers are leaving the area. Most of them are leaving the state. State. That, right. Yeah, that's continues to be true. But what we are seeing now that we hadn't seen before is we are seeing people from the valley and downtown LA want to come up and live in and you know Thousand Oaks and Westlake Village and Ventura they want to get away but that is driven by by something else that has nothing to do with the density what they're what they're seeing they're just seeing their money go further they're finding it more affordable they're they don't, they're not tied any longer to where they work. If they're allowed to work at home and they're all of a sudden telecommuting or now only have to go in the office one day a week versus five days a week when things get back to normal because they've proven that they can work from home and there's advantages and benefits to employees and to employers, people are saying, hey, if I don't have to be near my office, which happens to be in one of these dense, more expensive locations, then I might as well go out where I can buy more house for less money and get a little room to roam. That's really what is happening. So, and I think that you're gonna see that trend continue. And uh, uh, and especially as, as employers establish work at home as a more permanent benefit to being able to recruit talent. I know we've embraced it. Absolutely. Um... All right. With all of that said, David, uh, give everybody your information once again. Uh, you can reach me, David, at everhome.io and 805-379-3300. Uh, I cannot stress it again. If you'd like to be a part of this call and ask us a few questions and be here live or even look at our archive, go to coachingcalls.info, not .com, not .net, not .org. Coachingcalls, with an S, dot .info. Secondly, if you want to learn about the 30-day hack, it works. Um, I'm thinking of doing another potato diet just for my own personal amusement, uh, just to see how thin I can get and how much meat I can get to drag off my skin. Um, if you'd like to learn about broadcasting, podcasting, media, marketing, content, any of those things, go to lehonish, L-E-E-H-O-N-I-S-H.com. My information is there, including all of my numbers.